So happy Monday, everybody, and welcome to the third and final session of Bar Convent Brooklyn's Italian Spirits webinar series, sponsored by our friends at the Italian Trade Agency. My name is Carlos Rodriguez. I'm the event director for Bar Convent Brooklyn, and it is my absolute delight and pleasure to introduce our panelists for today's webinar. Um, so we have Livio Lauro, um, today's awesome speaker, and Daniela Porro from the Italian Trade Agency, who will tell you a little bit about their organization. Uh, but before we start, I wanted to share just a quick few housekeeping notes. First of all, I want to let you know that we are recording today's webinar and that we are going to be sending out an email with the recording to you tomorrow. If you're having any difficulty hearing us at all and are listening through your computer, just please make sure that your speaker volume is turned all the way up. If you're still facing issues, you can message us using the chat box function, which is located on the right-hand side of your screen. Also on your right-hand side of your screen, you'll see a PDF there, um, a PDF handout that you can open and you can use to follow along on today's presentation. At the same time, using that chat box on the right, please feel free to ask as many questions as you like at any time throughout the same uh, chat box, and uh, we'll get them to Libya. Um, so with that being said, let me first um, give it away to uh, Daniela, who's going to talk about the um, Italian Trade Agency Spirits Promotion Project. Daniela. Thank you so much, Carlos. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us here today. Sadly, given the circumstances, we can't meet in person. That's like what we like to do as Italians, but this is definitely the best next thing. Um, we're very excited to be partnering, partnering with Bar Common. This is our third and final webinar series, and we're really sad about it. So thank you for sticking with us. Um, this online uh, educational seminars are part of a larger spirits promotion project that started back in 2018. And with the rising popularity of mixology and the use of Italian spirits behind the bar, we have continued uh, this project throughout the years. Um, the ITA is a government agency and the Food and Wine Department is based um, in New York City. And we focus on increasing awareness on Italian spirits and uh, which range from distillates to fortified wines to liqueurs and cordials. And Libby will give you a very, very fun explanation on some of them today. Uh, we're thrilled to share this series with you to get to know our products, the traditions, the ingredients, the craftsmanship. And we're very extremely proud of Italian made spirits. And we hope that these webinars that we've been hosting will definitely help you in the future when you're trying to look for a particular spirit and hopefully you know choose an Italian one. Um, our hashtags for the project are uh, hashtag drink Italian and hashtag drink uh, Italian spirits. And we also have a very fun handy dandy website called italianspirits.us, which has a lot more information on the categories, um, which we will kind of touch base on today, but they definitely go a lot more in depth on our website if you're interested in looking at that. And so with that being said, we hope you enjoy this webinar and I'll hand it to the man of the hour, um, Livio Lauro. Hello, everybody. Hopefully everybody can hear me okay. Welcome to the world of vintage Italian cocktails. Um, happy to be here with you. Uh, hopefully, I have we have already uh, met before. Um, but today we're going to pay tribute to some amazing Italian cocktails. Uh, I believe that if you are on this webinar today with me to learn about cocktails, you really are making the best you can of what is a challenging year. And I thank you for joining us as always, and we appreciate uh, you hanging out with us today to talk about. Uh, some of the beautiful things that Italy has to offer to the beverage world. Uh, you know, one thing I have to say is whether you're a bartender or a server or a general manager or you're employed in a liquor store or own one or an importer or a distributor, our jobs are always changing. They continue to change all the time. If you're a bartender, you wouldn't think you would need some of the machinery uh, that you use today just five years ago. And so all of our jobs keep on changing and ultimately we are survivors. So no matter what our recent, our, our next uh, or imminent future will look like, I think we are all going to be in a really bright place. Um, before I introduce myself officially, I just want to thank our uh, partner brands today with the ITA. They are Luxardo Bitter, Poli Chiara di Moscato from the Poli Grappa producer, Coqui Vermouth di Torino, and 1814 L'Aperitivo from uh, Cazzoni. Uh, just like last week, today is interactive, so please feel free to comment 
uh, ask any questions and I will respond to them periodically as I check in uh, with Daniela. Uh, speaking of, I want to thank Daniela and I want to thank Paula. I want to thank the ITA team as well as the uh, Bar Comment team for uh, helping us put this together. If we have not met before, my name is Livio. I grew up on an island on the Amalfi Coast called Ischia. I lived there for almost 20 years of my life. I also lived in Rome for a little bit. And as an Italian bartender, I am fascinated by the amazing success of the Spritz and the Negroni, which are two cocktails that are staples across the globe. But the purpose of the seminar is to uh, point out, or I should say webinar, is to point out that there is just more than that to Italian cocktails. So I am pleased to bring you 12 special cocktails, all of which have a very huge cultural uh, significance in, in Italy and are um, uh, time-tested delicious products. Uh, a few other cocktails that I will not be talking about, just so uh, just to get that out for today, that are also staples are the Americano, uh, the Milano Torino, and the Sgropino, or the uh, Bellini, or the Rossini, all of which are really cool Italian cocktails, but I do feel like there is plenty of great information out there on those already. Um, so today we're going to talk about some that you may, heard of, may have heard of, some that you may have never heard of. Uh, some that even for me, I, would, I was making them 25 years ago, and I never thought they would be a classic, and I, and I, and I chuckle, you know, when I, um, when I have to talk about them, because I remember them in a very infant stage. Um, I'm assuming there are no comments yet, but I will check in. No, nothing yet. Nothing yet. Fantastic. Okay, let's talk with, let's start with drink number one. Drink number one is called the Angelo Azzurro. I've seen this already on some menus in America, and sometimes in America we'll just call it the Angel, because it's a lot easier. Basically, it means Blue Angel. Now, the recipe for the Blue Angel will vary a lot. When I made it at nightclubs, and the reason why I put it in this small uh, cocktail glass is to humor myself, because this is a nightclub cocktail. It's been a staple for over 30 years, and there's really no... Um, clear story on how it, it was invented or who invented it but when I made it it was on the rocks and it was just chucked down in nightclubs where people wanted to uh, have a good time and party so the fact that it has um, graduated to this beautiful cocktail glass with a nice orange zest on top is something that really makes me smile but it is how it is commonly served today so it has made its way to being a little bit more fancy this drink is two ounces of gin three quarters of an ounce of a premium triple sec, and a quarter of an ounce of blue curacao. It is served and it is strained and it, uh, it is gar garnished with a lemon peel. A little quick note on um, something else that is Italian connected. As you know, the juniper uh, grows everywhere in Europe and uh, of course everywhere in Italy. Uh, however, we have a very, very rich uh, juniper uh, product in Piedmont and in Tuscany and a lot of Italian juniper actually makes it inside of most of the gins that you might taste today. Additionally, Italy has started to uh, create a lot of delicious gins as well. So our gin culture has increased and how appropriate that this cocktail has turned all gin. When I used to make it, there was a little bit of vodka in it as well. It used to be gin vodka, triple sec in blue curacao. Now it's just gone all gin. It's so delicious. Um, I was shocked by how delicate it was, you know? And um, so there's your first drink, drink number one, Angela Zudo. You can also call it Angelo. It has been a staple, it is a party drink, and um, I uh, hope you enjoy it. Obviously, all the recipes will be in your handout. Um, and, and I am going to be moving fast because we have 12 drinks and we have 30 minutes, but if you do have questions, please, please, please do ask. This next drink here is something that I, think is one of the greatest drinks I've ever had. It is called the Asmara. The Asmara was recently discovered in a 1947 cocktail book called Cocktails Portfolio. It was discovered by a friend of mine, his name is Paolo Ponzo, and I, I believe he might even be on the, on the um, uh, webinar today. So Paolo said, you say, but uh, But uh, while Paolo was doing a research at the uh, National Library of Florence for a different 
cocktail uh, book he was researching. Uh, he was looking for, because in 1966, the Arno had a flood in Florence, a lot of the presses disappeared. So many books were never uh, recovered. Well, he found this one book called uh, Cocktails Portfolio. And in it, there's a few cool recipes, but the one that I love the most is called the Asmara O Negroni. So the, 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 uh, the, um, the author decided that it would either be called the Negroni or the Asmara. Um, but he also has a Negroni recipe listed in the book. So I'm just gonna go with calling this Asmara. It is a half ounce of Luxardo Bitter Rosso, so a half ounce of bitter liqueur, one and a half ounces of gin, and one ounce of Bianco Vermouth. And just that Bianco really does an amazing job. The bitter gives it that nice little gentian flavor to it, but also a really nice pink color that is, is uh, uh, truly uh, amazing. Uh, I did also mention that in the book that Paolo discovered, he also found the, oh, oh, the earliest recipe of the Negroni cocktail uh, uh, ever in a European cocktail book. And he also discovered some news on another drink that we will be talking about in, in a little bit. And I'm not going to um, uh, ruin that story for you quite yet. Before I do move on, let me just talk about Luxardo Bitter, which was in this cocktail. Luxardo is obviously a prestigious family-owned liqueur producer. They were founded in 1821 in Zara, which was in Dalmatia. And uh, Zara was the Venetian capital uh, for about 400 years. And then it became a part of Italy in 1918. Of course, Luxardo is better known for its maraschino liqueur, which is an industry uh, standard. But this product here is their bitter, and it's obtained from separate infusions of bitters, herbs, aromatic, uh, aromatic plants, and citrus fruits with water and alcohol. And then they uh, blend these infusions together. You get a distinctive flavor of gentian and wormwood. Uh, really a great product, and um, I, uh, I highly recommend. We're going to move on to a third drink here. And after this one, uh, I'll check in if there's any questions. So, this drink here is actually, an, if you look at it close, it's layered, but of course, we made this before jumping on the call, and it's still layered, but it's probably not easy to see. Through the um, through the video camera, it's called a bicerin, which means little glass or bicerin, depending on uh, the dialect you're using. Typically, more bicerin. Bicerin means bicerino, little, just a little glass. This drink is an evolution from a drink that was served in the 1700s called bavareta. And originally, the three ingredients, which are espresso, fresh cream and um, liquefied dark chocolate or janduya were served in three different glasses. I will uh, remind, if you've listened to a few of these seminars, you know that in Italy, most cocktails were born from establishments that did more than cocktails, right? They were more coffee shops and chocolatier shops and, um, and pastry shops. And of course, amongst those many things, they uh, made espresso. Well, the place where this was born uh, opened in 1763, and of course, it's called Café Albicerin, which takes the name for this product. And uh, it, of course, served, it was a, it's, it's still open, by the way, a huge coffee and chocolate uh, uh, vendor. And so, of course, they mixed all these, all these ingredients together. Uh, historically, it's served in all of Piedmont bars. And so it is a very uh, common drink. Now, to be honest with you, the addition of the grappa is my addition, because as you know, in Italy, we love to make things corretto, right? Corretto means to correct your coffee drink with something else to give it a little pizzazz, whether that pizzazz is an extra layer of flavor or whether that pizzazz is a little bit of alcohol. So in this drink, bicerin, I recommend to make it corretto and add a little bit of uh, grappa in there. Uh, the grappa that I used was uh, Poli Chiara di Moscata, Moscato, and Poli has been producing grappa since 1898. So we're talking about a uh, historical, historical brand. Uh, they make grappa from various varietals, but this one here is made with the musket grape from the Ugandan Hills. 
bottled at 40% alcohol by volume. I love to tell the story about this uh, This company is one of the fun facts is Jacopo uh, Poli, who currently runs the company, is the son of Giobatta, who was the son of Antonio, who was the son of Giobatta, who was the son of Antonio, who was the son of Giobatta, who was the son of Antonio. Oh, I think you can take that all the way down to 1749. So clearly when they are putting their name on a product, uh, they, they, they need business. Um, let me check in with you, Daniela. Yeah, so first of all, I just wanted to tell the audience to definitely download the handout that we made because all the recipes are on there and it will be a lot easier to follow if you have that handy. And then, yes, we have a question from Nate and it says, how does Bianco Vermouth dif differ from standard dry vermouth? I'm sorry, uh, I would love to hear that question one more time. How does Bianco Vermouth differ from standard dry vermouth? Oh, they're much different. So dry vermouth is gonna be much more dry and quote unquote, whiny. So you're gonna get a dry wine with herbs. Bianco Vermouth has a lot more sweetness to it, a lot more tropical notes. Uh, I'm not saying that they shove the peach in there, but you get these really tropical uh, notes in it and a lot more sweetness. Um, quite honestly, Bianco uh, is my personally my favorite vermouth. Uh, of course, I love a nice, sweet vermouth di Torino inside of a, a Manhattan. But if I were to, because you have to remember in Italy, a lot of people drink vermouth on the rocks. Just it's a cocktail of its own. Um, when I do that, it is Bianco. And thanks for the question. That is actually a really good question. It is often confused that Bianco and dry could be very similar, but they're really not. Any other questions for me? No, that's it for now. Awesome. Okay, we're still in Northern Italy here and we're gonna uh, run into another nice cocktail called La Bicicletta. La Bicicletta was invented in Northern Italy sometime during Italian fascism between 1922 and 1943 was when Italy was fascist and it's considered a the Italians typically refer to it as cocktail da osteria. Osteria is basically a simple, easygoing uh, uh, Italian restaurant, typically family run, very rustic, and just uh, basic, but ref uh, elegant in its own basic way. And the reason why I mention that is this cocktail is intended to be very simple, just built right on the rocks, nothing fancy, we don't need to barrel age it, we don't need to do any of those wonderful things that we love to do. All we need to do is take three ounces of a crisp white wine, then we take an ounce of the Luxardo Bitter Rosso, and we add another ounce of the soda water on top. We prepare this directly over ice, we garnish it with a lemon or an orange. Not a lot of rules. Remember, uh, you can have it at the bar with a lemon and you can go to the bar next door and it has an orange with it in it. These are very simple, basic uh, cocktails, but this drink here is absolutely delicious. Um, it is frequently also known as the Aragosta, so it has two different names, uh, depending on the region you go into. And of course, the regionality of the cocktail is the white wine. So if you are in a different region, you might be using a different white wine uh, that is, uh, closer to where you are from. Now, even the recipe of the bicicleta and to some extent of other cocktails that we will be tasting today, they can be very debatable. Um, some people like to add more of the bitter and less of the wine. So the question is, do you want your bitter with a little bit of wine in it or do you want your wine with a little bit of bitter in it? I find that this recipe is perfect. It's sessionable. It's delicious. It's got that nice uh, tartness to it. Um, the reason why it was called bicicleta, believe it or not, and I'm feeling it in one sip, is because when you drink, people gravitated towards drinking it so much that it was common that they would go to the bar or to the osteria with their bicycle. And then, and they would do that on purpose because they knew that on the walk back home, they were going to be a little bit dizzy so they could walk their bike home. They wouldn't have to drive a car or ride a moped, drive a moped or push their Vespas. They would just walk their bike home as they have a little dizziness going on. All righty. Okay. Moving on to the next one. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. This cocktail here is called Il Cardinale. You might 
uh, have tried it if you live in New York or if you've ever visited uh, Dante. It's a it's one of the their staple cocktails there as well. This cocktail was invented at the Orum Bar inside the Hotel Excelsior in Rome, which is now known as the Westin Hotel Excelsior in Rome, in 1950 by a barman by the name of Giovanni Raimondo. There are actually a few versions of this cocktail, uh, but the, the version that I'm going to make is the one that came from the, the, the creator himself, or the one that I made here is uh, the, the creator himself. So many people gravitated towards that bar uh, when China Città opened in Rome, which was a, uh, which is a, a, a amazing, it's, it's our Hollywood, right? Hollywood in, in um, Italy is in Rome in China Città. And so there were a lot of people, a lot of uh, famous people that gravitated towards Rome. And one was, a, one was a cardinal by the name of Cardinal Schumann. And he would love to drink a cocktail with his Riesling wine in it. It was gin, Riesling, and uh, Bitter Rosso. And then one day, Giovanni Raimondo said, hey, what do you think if we put some dry vermouth in it to replace the Riesling? So there are two versions, gin, dry vermouth, Bitter Rosso or gin, Riesling, uh, and uh, Bitter Rosso. I am doing the one with the dry vermouth because it's the one that is featured still today from the 1950s at the bar there. And it is just a light, refined, just a beautiful aperitivo cocktail. Of course, very boozy, so more your evening uh, uh, cocktail, maybe less for less hosteria less easygoing afternoon walk the bike home, more swanky, um, you know, uh, Dolce Vita, beautiful Italian life. Any questions before I move on? Yes, so actually maybe this should, we should answer this later because it's, it's about Negroni, so maybe we should do it when we talk about this. I would love yeah. to, Mike, I would love to. If you hang on till the end, I will definitely love to answer all the Negroni questions, okay? Okay. Thank you. Any other ones, Daniela? No, just this one. All right, keep them coming. Okay, our next drink is going to be Garibaldi. Garibaldi, another drink that I made so many of these uh, in, in when I bartended in Italy. It's an amazing, uh, refreshing cocktail. The reason why it's called the Garibaldi is it's the color red is the same color of the red freedom fighters that General Garibaldi used when he unified Italy. It became popular somewhere in the 80s. And of course, it unifies Italy also because um, the ingredients, right, the bitter from north and the oranges from the south was the unification of a country that was previously not unified. This drink is so easy, so sessionable. Once again, it's one of those drinks that, as I mentioned earlier, easily come from those Italian uh, cafes and, uh, and coffee shops and ice cream parlors because they're always squeezing fresh orange. orange. Fresh orange is a part of the thing. And then on the shelf, some of them might only have a dozen bottles of liqueurs, but of course, bitters and vermouth are always part of that because they tie, they go hand in hand with espresso and juice drinks. And so the Garibaldi was born some way like that. Uh, I believe that the uh, best recipe of the Garibaldi is one and a half ounces of the bitter, uh, Luxardo Rosso and four and a half ounces of the fresh OJ and the OJ must be fresh. And when you, of course, to squeeze it and it gets all fluffy, the drink gets fluffy itself. Of course, this one here is a couple of hours old. Um, but and I, the way I was taught when I started uh, bartending was that the actual orange goes tucked in between the glass itself and the ice cube. I'm not sure you can see it here, but that's how I did it, and I'm going to go ahead and take a sip of this one as well. Oh, oh. So, in Italy, when somebody is very bold and very courageous and thinks outside of the box and makes something happen, they are considered Garibaldino. They're, that, Garibaldi is the equivalent of brave, too. So, this drink isn't just a drink, it's a way of life. Okay, let's move on. Uh, let me just check my timer here. So I am on track. Okay, next drink we have is called the Ugo. You may have heard about the Ugo already, but it originated in Trentino Alto Adige. It was created in 05 by a cocktail by a bartender by the name of Roland Gruber. 
uh, at, at the San Zeno Wine and Cocktail Bar in Bolzano. It's a, he created it to make an alternative to the spritz, which an alternative it is. And a lot of people uh, will say that, you know, if you're in, especially in the uh, 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 Trentino area, a lot of people will prefer that you go to the spritz and there's healthy, beautiful debates about it. Um, the ingredient is four ounces of Prosecco or a dry sparkling wine, one ounce of elderflower syrup, and one ounce of soda water. It was originally created with a lemon balm syrup or lemon grass syrup instead of the elderflower, but it became not easy to find. Additional changes happened all from the bartender himself. Was this drink used to be called the Otto and then just renamed it the Hugo. It's actually called Hugo, but I know that here we're gonna call it the Hugo. Wherever you go, I go. So refreshing, easy drinking, very low in alcohol. If you have the, to walk the bike home with that one, you might be actually able to uh, ride your bike home, okay? We're gonna move on, plowing away. This drink here first came out in a 1936 cocktail book called Mille Misture by a cocktail, by a, a bartender by the name of Elvezio Grassi. In this book, he credits a bunch of other books from where he gets his sources. And in this, uh, when it comes to this cocktail here, he credits somebody by the name of Royce, R-O-I-C-E. Now, every other person he credits in that book, including Harry Craddock himself, um, I could find a connecting name, but I cannot find a connecting name to Royce. Now, in the beginning of the book, he spells a different Royce, R-U-R-E-U-S-S. -S -S. Maybe they're the same person. Maybe one is spelled phonetically and one is spelled the right way. But nonetheless, this is where, uh, this is a really cool cocktail. Um, believe it or not, it's arguably the oldest recipe that I can think of that has grappa in it. So it's from 1936, one ounce of uh, poli chiara di moscato, half ounce of brandy, now I cognac, I believe that in 70, in 60, in 70 years, uh, grappa has really come a long way. So it is my opinion that if you make this at home, you might want to just consider yanking the cognac and doing one and a half ounces of grappa and see how it comes out. But in its original recipe, it's one ounce of grappa, half ounce of cognac, half ounce of maraschino liqueur, half ounce of lemon, half ounce of orgeat, and two dashes of orange bitters. And of course, that is in your handout. It's a, it's a, I can't say enough about it. It's such a delightful cocktail. And we all know the combination of lemon juice and orgeat are really good. I also believe that despite the fact that we don't know who Royce is, nor do we know if Royce actually created the cocktail. It might just be the book where the cocktail was picked from. We don't know any of that, but I believe that the combination of grappa, Maraschino, lemon, not lime, lemon, which is very common in Italy, and orgeat are typical Italian utilized ingredients. So it is my speculation that that cocktail is not only a historical Italian cocktail, but also made by somebody Italian or bartending in Italy. The next cocktail comes from Brescia. And in Brescia, you're not allowed to call it the Pirlo Spritz, despite somebody call, sometimes people will call it the Pirlo Spritz, but the Pirlo is the uh, uh, is from the uh, city of Brescia, and it is said I don't want part of that conversation that it predates the Spritz. Okay, and uh, this drink here is made with three ounces of crisp white wine. Once again, the white wine is important to uh, as, to get as local as you can. One ounce of the bitter rosso or aperitivo, right? So in the original recipe is made with a bitter rosso. However, it is also commonly made with an aperitivo, lightly lower in alcohol. Um, but if you ask a diehard Pirlo drinker, they will laugh at the option of the aperitivo. However, it's a thing and it is very, very common. Why is it called a Pirlo? Not because of the famous Italian soccer player, who by the way, happens to be from Brescia as well. How confusing is that? But it's because when you actually add the bitter in it, in Brescian dialect, birla, that means it's falling in and it's creating a splash. 
So that's where this all came from, because in essence, it's splashing into the wine, which is why the recipe is highly rich in wine. Oh, forget about it. Just floral. I don't know how these ingredients, when you mix them together, they taste so amazing. Just floral, highly romantic and, uh, and wonderful. Okay, moving on. The next cocktail we're going to have, looking at the time here, the next cocktail we're going to have is called the Puccini. Puccini was created in 1948 by a bartender by the name of Renato Hausmann at the Posta Hotel in Cortina da Pizza. That is in, ben in the Veneto region. It's named after the composer of Madame Butterfly and many other. It is obviously popular in Northern Italy. In Northern Italy, it is typically not made with a mandarin liqueur. The only downfall of this really cool, amazing drink is that the mandarin is not always available. So sometimes we have to take a mandarin that is at the season and we augment it with a mandarin liqueur, but it's eight, eight um, uh, fresh segments of a, tanger of, a, of a tangerine, a little bit of mandarin liqueur, muddle, 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 add some ice, a, about four ounces of Prosecco, give it a stir and filter into a, uh, Flute like this, really great cocktail. Such an amazing drink. So, so amazing. Okay, we're gonna move on to the next drink, which is called El Sbagliato. Now, Sbagliato, many of you have probably heard of it. Hold on, I'm just gonna check the time. Okay. Many of you have probably already heard of Los Sbagliato. Los Sbagliato is a drink from Milano. It was created in 1980s. It is said to have been a mistake, right? Osbayato, perhaps uh, the bottle of gin, which is what Mirko Stocchetto from Bar Basso was trying to grab when he was making a Negroni, uh, had been moved by the bar back. And instead of grabbing the bottle of gin, as you know, when you're in the swing of things, and if you've ever been to Bar Basso, you are definitely in the swing of things. It is a busy happening bar in the heart of Milan. Um, you just grab the bottle, you pour it in, and he realizes that instead of grabbing the bottle of gin, he grabs a bottle of spumante, which is a dry, sparkling wine from Italy, right? So the Negroni Sbagliato technically is equal parts of Prosecco or spumante, uh, 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 Luxardo Bitter Rosso, and Cocchi Vermouth di Torino uh, in equal parts. Now, a lot of people like to add a little more. Uh, Prosecco or Spumante to it, especially if you look at the pictures of Barbasso's uh, drink, it is a huge drink. It's definitely not a three ouncer. It is more of a four, five, or a six ouncer, and it has this ginormous ice cube in it, and it's served in this ginormous goblet. Now, to me, there's some indicators there that uh, Mirko, who, by the way, was a bartender at Harry's Bar in Venice, where the Bellini was created, and um, he is also accredited to having created the Rossini when he worked at the Cipriani Bar, at the Harris Bar in Venice. Um, it doesn't look like this was a mistake. It looks like they were messing around. They were like, hey, let's see what happens. And this was a pleasant uh, result of a wonderful, um, of a wonderful experiment. But nonetheless, believe that story or not, it's called the Negroni Sbagliato. But I feel, and a lot of people agree with me, that if you remove the word Negroni, it, it, uh, Sbagliato holds its own credit. And so it doesn't have to tackle on to the Negroni in order to be a legitimate Italian classic from the 80s. Mm. So good. So, so delicious. It just softens it up, makes it a little bit more sessionable, a more afternoon-y. Um, yet, don't get me wrong, it's, it, it has a nice, wonderful alcohol uh, kick to it. Um, at this time, because we introduced this ingredient into the drink, I should probably talk about uh, Cocchi Vermouth di Torino. Uh, it's an authentic Vermouth di Torino, which is a thing, and the recipe is about 100 years old. It's bottled at 16% ABV. Uh, Vermouth di Torino is, is important because it's a denomination that they have created in Turin. And you have to remember that these people have centuries of experience in figuring out the perfect balance between sweet, acid, and bitter. And so when you drink uh, a Vermouth di Torino, it truly is, excuse me, a cocktail of its own with, um, with wonderful acidity and a great balance between sweet. Um, most other sweet vermouths 
uh, that you find can be a little bit too sweet. Um, this uh, Vermouthy Torino style in its own, and of course, Koki included, have mastered that so much better. Um, all right, drink 12 out of 12. Um, actually, do we have any questions, Daniela, before I do this one? Um, yes, maybe I'll ask you the one about the Negroni, and then we can do the last one, and then we'll go straight to just questions, because we have a couple. So the question about the Negroni was, you mentioned the history of Negroni, but did not mention its inventor. I have heard that the drink was actually created by a South African barman named Armando Rosario, not an Italian. Is there <laughs> anything to this claim? Uh, uh, yes, Armando Rosario, is, who is a co-author of, of my book, The Twelve Cocktails, a dear friend and a a uh, real wise guy, the wisest of the wisest guys, um, claims, of course, in a funny way, that he created the Negroni. And so, Armando, if you created the Negroni, I invented the Caipirinha. Um, so there we go. Uh, next, oh, where did I go? Last drink right here. Sorry, folks, I am slightly getting tipsy. I mean, I, I won't be, I won't lie. I'm not going to ride the best. I'm going to stay here in my house. All right, so the last drink is the Venetian Spritz. Okay, this was created sometime in the 1800s in the kingdom of Lombardy, Venezia, which of course is now is, is Italy, but at the time it was, it was dominated by the House of Austria. And um, in that area, the Habsburg soldiers who were stationed in, in, uh, in, uh, in the kingdom of Lombardy, they had the uh, brilliant idea to add a little bit of a spray of water inside of the local wine. They felt like the wines of this area were a little bit too harsh, a little bit too strong in alcohol, so they added a little spray of water. Well, spray is called spritzen, which means a spray. Of course, in Italy, we're, we have a tendency of romanticizing everything, so spritzen went to Spritzen. And so the category called the Venetian Spritz was created, and there you have it. Uh, this one here, this Venetian Spritz here, is of course three ounces of Prosecco. Of course, that's the wine of the region. Uh, it has two ounces of Casoni 1814 L'Aperitivo, and it's topped with one ounce of soda water. So your traditional three, two, one recipe. Mm. All righty. Thank you very much. Okay, so a little bit about Cassoni uh, because we have it in this drink here. It's one of the oldest distilleries and liqueur factories in Italy. Uh, it's 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 really uh, authentic, despite despite the fact that in Italy or in America we have only recently been um, uh, you know exposed to this. It comes from an original recipe of the Cassoni family. It's from it's 15 alcohol by volume. And they only select locally harvest herbs and they blend it with Mediterranean fruit and out comes this really cool, easygoing, bright red, uh, bright orange red color uh, aperitivo. All right, aperitivos are lighter. They're more typically a little bit more uh, lighter in alcohol, a little bit more uh, agrumati, which means fruit forward than bitters, which are a little bit higher in alcohol and tendons have a tendency of giving bitter more of the forefront. These have a tendency of getting of giving citrus, oranges, and grapefruits more of the forefront. Okay, we walked through 12 cocktails. I'm the happiest person right now. I would love to uh, see if there are any questions. Yes, we have three. I think we'll be able to answer them. We have five minutes left in the webinar. Okay. So the first one is, looks like the Cardinale and the Asmata are very similar. Is the main uh, the cardinale and the what? And the asmara are very similar. Is the main difference using wine versus vermouth? Um, the main difference using wine versus vermouth. I think that the the um, the difference is in the flavor, right? If you taste the two drinks, there's really two different experiences. Bianco vermouth. I was talking about it earlier, right? It's unique. It's also kind of a bully. It, it When it comes into play, it shows up and it doesn't back off to a lot of other ingredients. 
So what happens is, is when you are, when you put that inside of a cocktail, it brings its own flavors to the table, which are again, those sweet tropical notes. The Cardinale, because it has dry vermouth, it's more whiny, more uh, acidic, less sweet, less tropical in the flavor profile. I'd also like to point out, and that was actually a really good question, and it's actually um, a, a, a very smart observation, but one of the things that's cool about Italian cocktails is if you buy six ingredients, you can make about 25 or 20, let's just say, really great Italian cocktails. Uh, they have a really good job at using similar ingredients, but creating different flavor profiles. And those flavor profiles, of course, come from local, local wine, local ingredients. And, and that, of course, makes a big difference. Thanks for the question. I hope I answered it to your extent, but the flavor profile of the two drinks is very similar, is very different. Um, so then the other one was, so really, there's little difference between the Pirlo and the Bicicletta. I'm sorry, say that one more time. I apologize. So there is a very little difference between the Pirlo and the Bicicletta. Yes, exactly. Yeah, again, that kind of goes back to uh, what I was uh, talking about earlier, right? These ingredients will literally uh, make the, the difference between, and honestly, there's a different, there's a very difference between Pirlo, Bicicletta, and Aragosta. And the local wine, of course, will make the difference, big difference, because when a drink, when 50% of the drink is made with white wine, then that white wine, of course, uh, will, will dictate the difference in the flavors. But yes, absolutely, uh, very good point. Um, and, the, and again, it's very local, right? You can't order a bicicletta in Brescia without getting stared down. Um, and then we have the last question is, do you use a store-bought or make your own edelflower syrup? And if you make it yourself, what is the recipe? Very, very, very good question. So this is my philosophy, okay? If you know me, you know that I don't just cover Italian spirits and Italian liqueurs. I am typically what we call a full book uh, uh, enthusiast. Of the game, um, when I have my Italian hat on, I very seldom believe that the um, homemade needs to be a thing because they're supposed to be simple. You're supposed to grab it off the shelf and make it in three minutes. You should be three minutes away from your cocktail. So I in, I do not make my own elderflower syrup. Um, I researched a few of them, and believe it or not. Uh, I did a video on this once. I, I buy the Monin because I believe it's the most common one people will find off the shelf. I would like people to embrace the Hugo or the, or the Hugo. And to do so, those ingredients need to be readily available. They need to walk down their liquor store aisle or their grocery store aisle and find the bottle. Now, once the Hugo becomes popular and once the Hugo, Hugo becomes a drink that everybody likes, then of course you could start getting a little bit more nerdy and uh, finding your better ingredients. But long answer, uh, I'm gonna, but short uh, recap to a long answer, store-bought. The last thing I wanna do on this video or on this webinar or any of the other ones is talk anybody out of their next cocktail. It should literally be five minutes away. Um, that's it. Very cool. We are one minute early. Talk about Italian precision. You know what? You couldn't have planned it better. That is perfection in every possible aspect. So um, thank you so much, Daniela. And of course, thank you, Livio. I could listen to y'all all day long, but we do have a, we do have a time limit to keep to. So thank you again. That was an absolutely awesome presentation. So informative. Um, to everyone who joined, thank you for joining, and uh, we hope you enjoyed this webinar series sponsored by the Italian Trade Agency, focusing on Italian spirits in particular. Um, if you miss any of the previous webinars in that series, don't worry. They are available on the BCB website. Um, if you go to bartonforbrooklyn.com and you click on Infuse 365 at the top, you'll be able to see all of the webinars in the series. 
Um, and they're also available on YouTube. So um, with that, thank you again, Daniela and Livio. Thank you again for everyone who joined and ciao. Ciao. Ciao everyone. Thanks.